I'm going to ask the choir to give the choral call to prayer for our prayer. Also, while I'm doing this, uh, the last hymn is 437. There's no hymn in you. There's no number in your bulletin. Today is World Communion Sunday. On this day across the globe, Christian communities in every place will be gathering to celebrate communion during their time of worship. As we long for Christ to be present in our lives now and in the times to come. And so our focus this morning is taken from the reading for today from the Gospel of Matthew and a quote taken from the prophet Isaiah as he relays a message to his people. He wrote, I am about to do a new thing. Do you not perceive it? He was speaking for God. These words were written by the prophet as a message from God to the people who at that moment when they were written were living in exile when they'd lost their land and they were living in slavery in a foreign land. The gospel lesson speaks to us during a time when Jesus is under scrutiny by the chief priest of the religious authority of that day. They were seeking a way to get rid of Jesus. So he tells them this parable about the vineyard, which could be viewed, and many do, in light of the cross to come, But this morning for World Communion, I want you to hear this parable in light of the world in which we're living at this very moment. See if it speaks to us a little differently, but with the same message. Think of the vineyard as the world community. The landowner is God. God has put fences around parts of the world vineyard and given them to select tenants for a time to watch over and care for the vineyard for God. When it comes harvest time, God sends his representative to collect God's share of the vineyard, what the vineyard has produced. It's the rent, as you know, for the use of the property by the tenants. And instead of paying God's representative the fair share of the produce produce from the land, the tenants rather beat, stone, and even kill the representative. They do not render their fair share to the landowner. So finally, in frustration, God sends his son, thinking the tenants will surely respect the owner's own son and render what is due. But instead, the tenants begin to think, well, if we kill the son, perhaps then we will be the owners. and We can claim everything as our inheritance. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? We do not know the history of all the peoples who inhabit this planet, but we do know part of our own history for the vineyard known as the United States. Most of our ownership rights are based on some assumptions about the land. First, that the claimants who settled here were doing it under a writ from the King of England or other European power. The King of England, we believed, received his authority from God by virtue of bloodline and was empowered by such a position to declare who owned land and who were the rightful owners of pieces of land. Since that time, a series of land transactions between parties in North Carolina as recorded in the Register of Deeds, and if it's not there, it doesn't count, give us claims to what we say is our piece of the vineyard usually in partnership with some lender somewhere. As in Scripture, when the descendants of Abraham were led by Moses, you recall, out of Egypt, in what we know as the Exodus, they moved ultimately into a piece of the vineyard known as Canaan. 
and began to settle there because it was viewed to be the promised land for the heirs and descendants of Abraham. We are good about thinking about what is me, mine, and ours. But where is God in that picture? When do we acknowledge that all that we have is but a gift from God and that we are simply the stewards of that gift? Where is God's portion for the part of the vineyard that you and I inhabit and call home, whether rented or deeded? My mother's family grew up on some acreage that her grandfather settled in Alamance County under a deed or a grant rendered by the authority of the King of England. They have farmed that land for centuries, even unto the present day. They also have, at various times, had tenant farmers on a portion of that land. And at one time, they had a tobacco allotment from the state of North Carolina, the ultimate authority, which allowed them to grow a certain amount of tobacco based on the total acreage being farmed. Now, I'm not going to try to figure that out for you. You can just take my word on it. They contracted with some tenant farmers to farm the tobacco acreage, mainly because that is very hard work if you haven't done it. And in turn, for producing the crop, they were allowed housing for their family and could grow their own crops on some of that land to eat. When the tobacco went to market, they got a share of the proceeds that it brought as well as the landowner. My point is that tenant farming described in this parable has been around a very long time. It is still very much a part of the farm system and other agricultural system that provide much of the food that you and I eat. But what happens when the tenants do not want to render a portion of their fruits to the owner? What happens if it steps, it goes a step further and the tenant now wants to assert their claim to this land as their own? At that time, we see fighting and we see war break out much like what we see going on across the world community, even as we speak. All of those stories are much more complex than this parable. But as we think about the world community this morning, we can ask ourselves, is part of the story behind the conflict related in some way to the parable that Jesus is related to the chief priest of that day? In this case, Jesus is saying to the chief priests who see Jesus as a threat to their system, their system of authority and their system of running the temple, he says to them, that which you are rejecting will become the cornerstone of something God is doing. He's referring, scholars believe, to the crucifixion to come and the coming of a new way of being in fellowship with God, which is open to all through Jesus Christ as a risen Savior. He says in verse 43, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the people that produce the fruits of the kingdom. So maybe what we should be focused on as we read this parable and as we look at our lives today is this question. What are the fruits of the kingdom? If we put that question in terms of the vineyard One commentary suggests God expects us to produce fruits of praise and glory. God expects us to share our blessings with others, to feed the hungry of the world, to mend broken relationships, and to forgive ourselves and others. But instead, we often find ourselves not praying, neglecting the needs of others, and focusing only on our own needs. And yet, God continues to send us love and grace in the hope that our hearts will turn to God first. That we will think of worshiping God with praise and all, no matter, no matter what the state of affairs in the world happen to be at any given moment. All in thanksgiving for what God has provided and does provide for us. God has called and is calling us as tenants in his kingdom to faithfulness. God is the one who will provide for us if we will but trust his love and if we'll dare to share the fruits of the vineyard 
to God's glory and with each other. When I hear that call, I feel convicted because I know where my focus is at times, especially when under stress. The calling is hard to do when something or someone threatens us or our place in the vineyard. Could it be that we have somehow unintentionally become more like the chief priest in the parable than we realize? Could we be so distracted by our desires to succeed and to protect our piece of the vineyard that we do not even see the new thing that God is doing in our very midst? Is it possible that the new thing that God is doing will surprise us in a way that will ultimately gladden our hearts once we're there? Could it be that we cannot see what God is doing when the new thing begins to appear because of where we are focused during that time? Could it be that we are so distracted by things and noise that we miss what God is doing in us and, in, and around us? A piece that speaks to this, I think, comes from Plato in Book 7 of The Republic. You know it. It's the parable of the cave. Let me just paraphrase it briefly for you. A people were living deep in the cave in utter darkness. And one day, one of them escaped, found a way from the cave up to the ground above, out into the outside. At first... The daylight was hurtful to their eyes, which had only known darkness. But in time, their eyes adjusted in the light from the sun, and they discovered the beauty of the earth above ground. So this person went back to her colleagues in the cave and told them what she had discovered. And she urged them to follow her and join her outside the cave. But the others were so afraid of the light, and they'd grown so accustomed to the dark, that they would not venture out of the cave the kingdom of God is coming among us it's not future it's now and it began when Jesus arose from the tomb and began to teach us about living in the light on this world communion Sunday spend some time I invite you to consider doing this without words this day go outside contemplate God's vineyard around us Take a deep breath and let it out slowly. Sense the warmth of the light of God's sunshine, especially with the cold that we had this morning. Feel the Creator's blowing breeze upon your cheek. Look at the blowing clouds overhead and examine the uniqueness of any rock that you might see as you take a walk today. Let us come to this table the table of our Lord today with new eyes and seeking hearts as his adopted children. Let us come grateful for the gift of life, the life made known to us in the bread and in the cup. Let us, each of us, remember the sacrifice of those who've gone before us to provide what we know and share today in this place, in this country, and in the world community. And let us be bold to offer all of that which we have, ourselves and all that we are, to God's glory. And let God bring forth the fruits of his kingdom in our lives and in the world community in which we live. Let us pray together to have eyes to see this new thing that God is doing, lest we miss it. One final thought. As Tom Watson was chairing the recent Ryder Cup, he re reminisced of the time of the first Ryder Cup team he was on, and he shared that it was when the national anthem was played at the beginning of the event that he felt so proud to represent his country, and it dawned on him it was the first time playing golf that he'd ever represented his country. I started thinking about that, and I wondered, what, what if we had the same sense of awe and thankfulness about being a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's a great moment when we gather around this table and we celebrate the gift that we know from his sacrifice for us and for the unconditional love that he showers upon us every day. Draw near, my friends. Let us join the celebration of our Lord's presence and of his love, which now lives in us 
and through us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.